Thank you very much for, for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed our tete-a-tete -tete on, on LinkedIn and the conversation yeah. that we had. So I just felt it, it clicked somehow. And I'm very much looking forward to digging a little bit deeper into that conversation. Yeah, it was refreshing. It's funny, sales has changed so much over the years. Yeah. And it depends on who you talk to, but it's they're still living in the 80s and 90s reading the books that came from the even earlier on and talk about social selling and it just doesn't exist in their world because they haven't adapted to the new buying behaviors that you know surround us every day well i think what what really stands out to that audience is the word selling and social selling and the social part of it is being neglected how much do you talk to let's say traditional salespeople, and how much do you talk to let's say progressive salespeople. I'm actually, the psychographics of it is the traditional people think that what they're doing is working until it's yeah. not. And so that psychographic that I get is because I put out so much content now and I'm so consistent, finally, <laughs> and also having the podcast as well, that I don't really talk to traditional anymore because they're not in the right headspace for me to even have a good conversation. But it's this, you know, the SDR, BDRs, full cycle AEs, uh, sales managers that are going, I don't know what to do anymore. You know, what I grew up doing, what I was trained on isn't working. And now my job's on the line or there's pressure on me and I just don't know what to do. So I would say over 80% of who I talk to are salespeople that are want something different. And then there'll be the people in between, but I don't. They're not interested in changing because sales is change management. I'm not going to go and change your mind. The first thing you have to go into, you know, figure out is why change and why now? And I can't, if those options aren't on the table and the answer is I don't want to change and it's definitely not going to happen now. What's the point of entertaining a conversation? It, it's all about how big is the pain of staying where you are? And how big is the pain of making that change? And it's also, you're absolutely right. It, it is a, a management change, but also I feel a, a cultural change. So the, the mindset is different or needs to be different from what has worked 20, 30 years ago. Couldn't agree more. Shall I call you Nicholas or Nick? You are welcome to call me Nick. I, uh, I'll, I'll say this before, uh, before you put it in the podcast, but I have a trick. When I got into management, I got overwhelmed with email. And so what I did is I have an email filter and I put myself as Nicholas everywhere. So if you write Nicholas and you have it in a sequence or anything, it uh, gets filed in a different spot. But if you write Nick, it'll actually hit my inbox and I'll see it or else you're waiting until I get to it. That's a great trick. I've heard a similar trick when you put like an emoji in your LinkedIn profile name and then you automatically know, okay, is that did they scrap my email or did they scrap uh, LinkedIn and, and just put me in, in a sequence? I like that. I, I really like that. Yeah. And I was wondering why all small letters, why is this not capitalized? And you know, it's <laughs> those things. Well, thank you very much for that trick. <laughs> and that's the reason why it's all lowercase. Yeah. Yeah. So because LinkedIn, you can't really do that. I can't there. I wish LinkedIn would take, you know, Microsoft's robust, Outlook and somehow integrate it. So we have folders and I don't know what your DMS look like, but it's so hard to stay on top of communication because they make it so frustrating, even using like account lists and lead lists that only gets you so far, but they're, it's a horrible platform for communication directly. It, which is so ironic. So yeah. list of commenting or connecting. Get the heck off of LinkedIn because it's so hard to have a good conversation. It's I think it's good to to initialize a conversation and to just pop up in someone's inbox and then take it offline because okay. you're absolutely right. The messaging system that they have in place, I don't know, that's absolutely antiquated and, and outdated as well. <laughs> so they need a change of management there. <laughs> I yeah, I've I have been looking actually for digital transformation work at some of the integrations with Microsoft. So I, I might have some information for you in a couple of weeks because I'm meeting with a couple of Microsoft execs to go and discuss. Because I'm curious if there's integrations that they just don't share that. Because yeah. I don't know if you've used HubSpot or there's, I think Salesforce integrates as well. The HubSpot integration with Salesforce, with SalesNav teams is actually really nice. 
And it's yeah. funny because it plays to social psychology because now you get, who do we know that's similar or what company, like it builds on those shared interests. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, you don't yeah. get any of that until you're paying yeah. an arm and a leg for it. Yeah. And it, isn't that frustrating because that's what I feel LinkedIn should be all about. Facilitate. 100%. Um, professional connections and professional networks and leveraging on on what you have already and and where it could take you potentially w hopefully without being salesy and spammy and and pitchy that's the other thing that that i found um that makes me not want to use the messaging as much because it's it's just so filled with epic pitch i hate to say it but it's just one pitch after another and it's i have this game that i play whenever i get a new invite i bet how long it takes until i get a pitch i do the and same sometimes, game <laughs> sometimes it's one week sometimes two weeks but sometimes two minutes and so that's really fascinating that's like social selling uh topic uh that we can discuss i call it vampire sales oh okay why vampire? Because they leech off the energy. No, <laughs> you could play on a lot of that, but how, what, for a vampire to come into your house, what needs to happen? By, oh by my God, the... you have to, in... yes, you have, yeah. And that's similar to, to what happens on, on LinkedIn. And I wonder, I really wonder if people and, and organizations believe that this works on a larger scale finding the needle in a in a haystack you might have a win here and there and and some traction here and there you know on the other side the, the people that you just piss off with that behavior and and that potential damage in, in reputation is, is so immense yeah you can burn your entire tam in a couple of weeks if you have sales nav and you're building lists but think about it it's commodity sales they are commodities in themselves. When you spend less than five minutes building your account lists and there's no rhyme and rhythm, why the hell wouldn't you get treated as a commodity and only talk about price? You've sold yourself short by not investing into your accounts. How many people can actually quantify the value that they bring to the table in a discovery call or even in their prospecting? Almost none because they're like, oh, they fit the firmographic bet size, right area, boom. Who can I call top of the line? Kate, VP of sales, Kate, call, dial. And so there's no emotional connection. There's no effort put in. There's no value established. Most companies should just get rid of their entire sales team and they would actually do better and just focus on customer success because their sales team is doing nothing but scorching the earth with bad practices. But it's also like Freakonomics. You look at what they're being judged on and they're doing what they get recognized for. They don't care how they get there. Nobody judges them on how they act. It's, it's a typical hunter scenario. They only judge them by what they drag through the door. Look what I got. It's, it's still, it, it, that, that brings me to one topic that, you know, I was trained on a typical cold calling, typical spin and band methodologies, mm -hmm. like the traditional things that you mentioned early on. And it's just, I feel it's not productive. I mean, it really jumps in your face, the failure rate to success rate, the, the productivity versus the, the non-productivity. But still, there are so many sales teams who are pushed to do that from leadership, from sales uh, leadership teams and, and management teams. And, and I know for sure from firsthand that a lot of large organizations do that and even outsource lead generation and cold calling and, and uh, things like that. One of the largest corporations in, in, in the world. And you would think that they should be a little bit ahead of what everybody else is doing, but they're not. It's like going back to the stone age and is go on, on the hunt and chase some leads. And I've always kind of felt almost appalled by the language of, of traditional sales. You know, let's go chase that up and go for the hunt and, and all this very it aggressive. Feel like the Wolf kind. of Wall Street where it's just like yeah. that aggressive hunter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you said it before and, and you post about that on LinkedIn as well, that there is this misalignment of how differently people want to buy or have to buy if it's a, a large organization and the way vendors and, and sales is selling. So there, there's this huge misalignment. When did you feel that there is a disconnect and things should be done differently? There's a few different ways that this kind of came to be. 
being my all-inclusive stay in the hospital really reinforced this. And I wore my burnout like a badge of honor and it almost killed me. And I had to rethink my entire life in that hospital while I was healing. But one of the things when I was in investment banking is they had a, a quota of activity that I had to do per day. And I had to make a hundred plus calls. If I didn't have a hundred calls, I didn't justify space in the building and I would get fired. And it was a big deal. And it was funny because I'm watching the bullpen and listening to everybody pitching and you know, somebody get a good pitch. And of course it would go make its way around the bullpen. And there was a lot of wordsmithing, not a lot of actual relationship building. So it sounded good, but at the end of the day, nothing actually happened, but it hit the activity metrics that everybody was joining. And I don't know why, but there's a gentleman that we, I call it the race to commonality, where you always try to find that common point that we can always talk about. Like for us, we could talk shop all day because we love the psychology. We love the development of sales. So it's easy for us to talk about. You can't do that with everyone. And we got talking about a small town vibe. And for whatever reason, we just clicked and we kept talking. And so just what every day he would shoot me an email or I'd shoot him back an email. And we just kept that correspondence going for about, about six, just over six months. And I trusted him. He trusted me. I knew his entire family. I knew a lot of his friends from an email a day. You know, no more than five minutes of my time. He referred me the biggest piece of business that I had ever sold over $200 million transaction. And it was done almost on a virtual handshake. I had never met the gentleman and it was over a year of talking to each other before we finally met. And we had done this deal together and never actually went, met face to face. And this was before Zoom and everything too. So it made me realize like all these activity metrics, all these things they're teaching are going against human nature. And especially now I talked to all these sales leaders and I was like, so you guys are onboarding and ramping reps to do this, but I see you're on Amazon buying from a self-service portal. Well, yeah. So just to clarify, you want your team to sell in a way that you're not interested in buying. And so you watch people's behaviors. How do they act in the mall? How do they go and act when they're on a website? How do they act on social media? And you realize that we are coming further and further longer into the equation where they might be 80%, 90% done before they reach out to us or never at all. Because before we were the conduit of, to information, we were the doctor providing a prescription. Sales isn't about that a lot of the time now. It's not taught that way because it's not repeatable. They can't, it's not predictable revenue. They can't mass produce that. That takes a lot of years of training to go and have that work in collaboration, those give and take negotiations. So they just default to what's easy and what's trackable. And that is the problem with sales right now. And that's why you could get rid of most of the sales teams and they would produce just as much. But then the only problem is then the spotlight would be on marketing and we'd have to humanize that as well. Yeah, you're absolutely spot on. It's, it, I was thinking along your lines as well. So if, if we take the focus off of sales, and selling. So how can we provide the buyer or potential buyers with everything that they need in order to make a decision to get in touch with us? And so that transparency then needs to go or, or, the, or that, that focus needs to go from sales to, to the marketing and, and marketing needs to be much more inclined and intertwined with sales than ever before, because Sales and marketing both have individual KPIs traditionally that have grown over the past decades um, that, that don't really match and you don't really map them. So marketing, for example, okay, what's the KPI? How many leads do we generate per week or per, per day or per, per month? And that's it. That's all they focus on. And sales, of course, is about how many calls do you make? How many touch points do you have? How many meetings have you booked? And, and so forth. And, and I read a very good post from Refine Labs, which I'm, I'm pretty sure you Chris you know, Walker about. is breaking yes. ground there for sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely brilliant. And, and that post was basically advocating 
to change the KPIs across these departments, across sales and marketing, to focus on revenue. So marketing's KPI is not lead generation anymore, but it's revenue. How much revenue can you help generate? And I found that very interesting because now marketing is in a position that they have to talk to sales and sales needs to talk to marketing all of a sudden. And it's, what do we do now? We've never done that before, but eventually that's what it's all about. How, how can we be as collaborative as possible with potential buyers by giving them everything they need along their journey? Because we don't need, we, we don't know where they are in the journey, right? Yeah. That's a cl classical prospecting. It's like, yeah, I assume they could be here and then throw a dart and, and just hope for the best. And so th this post by Refine Labs, th that was really spot on. So let's change the KPIs and see what we can do together. Not waste time, be more productive and, and effective. What blows my mind, and I, I never knew this existed because I've been sales since I was 14, starting in sporting goods and working my way up. Did you know that companies will spend millions a year on product knowledge and will balk at spending $1,000 on customer research. And most marketing teams have never met an actual customer or spoke to them in real time. Yeah. I just want to throw that out there. We're talking about like KPIs exactly. and like the reality of B2B. How do you have That's those conversations with somebody you've never met before? How do you earn trust? with somebody that you've never stepped in their shoes or you can't understand the jobs to be done that causes friction in their life. Yeah. And, and you also, you have to understand what is important to your buyer, what or potential buyers, what do they think about? What do they, how do they feel about X, Y, Z? What did they do in the past about it? And what are their objectives? What, what are they trying to achieve and, and why is what they do right now, not enough to reach that goal. And, and if you don't talk to your buyers, it, I'm just wondering how does marketing do marketing without knowing all of that? It, that? That's why I wanted to bring it up. It's just, it's one of those things, you know, they talk about those things that live in your head rent free and you just can't really get it out. That one's been living there for about three to six months. And I, I just can't wrap my head around the logic. It doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't make sense. I feel it's really like a grown problem from how we started, let's say 50 years ago with sales and marketing. And, and that actually didn't change. It hasn't changed that much, but no. the other side changed. The, the buyer side changed with all the technology that is available right now. B2B is not that far apart from B2C, at least not from the psychological behavior. Yeah, they're B2B still, depending on the industry, certain industries have been, especially with COVID had been forced to transform and get caught up. A lot of industries are still five to 20 years behind. Yeah. I'm sorry if anybody from manufacturing is listening, but you guys probably have the biggest opportunity of anyone because access to all this information and data-driven decision-making could be a game changer, but. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting how buying preferences have changed, communication channels have changed, the brain has not changed, and yet we're selling like we did 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah and still hope for the best. But the, the thing is, you mentioned that you're not talking as much to, let's say, traditional salespeople anymore. Um, and, and it's still fascinating that there is this huge notion of what we are doing works there's this kind of cherry picking of little successes that that kind of justifies the way it's being continued this this is a hard deep topic that, that when you get into sales you get taught that you own your own destiny and when you fail you fail in silence you fail in isolation and so when you do not do well it's not the company's fault it's on you and so i think a lot of this stems from the lack of teamwork and the lack of what do you call them? They call it psychological security or they, they can't talk. They'll get mocked. I remember being in Monday morning meetings and you talked about a customer asking something about pricing or, and they would just make fun of you. So you just stop seeking help. You stopped needing assistance. You just suffered in silence. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of it is 
a lot of these salespeople, if they're money hungry and focused, they'll just follow the money, which leads to some bad behavior because what you're judged on leads to the behavior, right? That's what they, the reward system. And I think that's, it's so ingrained and it's not going to go away until sales changes their entire system. I was lucky because I started in insurance sales when I first got into my B2B world and we were paid on retention, which was a game changer because it wasn't wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Bye. It was, okay, is this a good piece of business? Should I place this business? Are you going to stay? Or should I just put this money into savings? Cause you're probably going to cancel, but they took our money back. So if the company canceled in the first two years, they actually clawed back our commission and I had to pay it back. But I, I think that changed my whole mentality. Like looking back hindsight being 2020, I think that changed my entire perspective on sales and really focusing on profitability and just good business, not just for the sake of sign here. Yeah. And, and that circles back to what you said in, in the beginning. It's about a, a management change. It's about changing the, the KPIs and how you measure success and, and also how you reward and incentivize your salespeople. If it's purely commission-based on, on traditional KPIs, number of uh, meetings booked, then you have the, the wolf of Wall Street, hunter and, and chaser. But I, I really liked that aspect of we measure your success of on how long the customer stays. I think that's a brilliant way of really incentivizing to bring good business, long-term business to the organization. That's brilliant. It was a tough adjustment after always getting paid up front, but it was good discipline L looking back at it now. <laughs> I don't know if I would do it yeah. again, but... <laughs> but that must have changed something in, in terms of how you qualified your leads, Absolutely. how you prospected them. So, so how did you adjust these little screws in your, in, in your sales strategy then? So this ties into how you're about to go into prospecting and then we circle back, but I started looking at the value to them and making an assumption and building this value hypothesis. And then all I did is instead of looking to see if they were, if they wanted to buy, and that was my qualification, my qualification is, were they ready to change? And did they see value in the change? And it was, this is why customer service outsells a lot of new business teams, because they actually see the value being realized by customers. That's why they make those recommendations and how to use your product service or that one feature that you don't talk about in your demo because they've seen them get excited. They've seen them get mad where a lot of salespeople walk away before that. So they're missing out on that, those tangible pieces. And so when you're, when I started prospecting, I started to look at what was the cost of doing nothing. And I started to build number values and it is hard. I can see why most people don't do this because it is extremely hard to look at a B2B company look at an individual and price them based on the opportunity of doing nothing and getting the right numbers for your formula that you can go and take to court or go, you know, be able to back up if they go and ask you, but they always do. If I said that maybe buying this disability policy, I'm expecting, you know, if you ever got hurt, it's worth X. Well, if that opportunity cost is a hundred thousand dollars, but they're only going to get maybe 80,000 in value don't place that business. It's not a net gain for them. But the thing that really changed my whole perceptive or my perspective on this is that it was perceived value. What is the perceived net value to them? And when you talk about business, it's on the account level and the individual level. And so you start with the victims. Who are the victims of nothing happening? Who is professional or personal success is being stunted by doing nothing, that they're angry and, oh my goodness gracious, are they a great source of information because they will talk about it. And then usually the person that owns a p &L, they don't want to change because they're the ones that bought, <laughs> they're the reason that bought the paid in the first place. And so this is where I see a lot of prospecting go wrong. And this is what I learned from that whole process is work your way up the p &L. Start with the victim, get that information to build that formula, to get that number, 
present it to the P&L owner, and then that's just good business. Oh, you're saying that if we make this change and buy your software suite, that's a $1.2 million increase with the cost of it being 300,000. So that's a $900,000 net growth, like growth this year. Kind of sounds like a no brainer. Let's dive into that more. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. I, th I think that's not only the perceived value, but also you can back it up with numbers, which is especially in B2B is important because they, of course, we make decisions based on emotions, but also on logic. So we need to justify the investment for a piece of software or, or whatever it is. So I, I really like that approach. That's absolutely brilliant. And every company has investments planned per quarter. It just depends on is yours high enough value and priority to make it on the top of the docket or not. And you know what? It's okay for it not to, because then that means you are that trusted advisor where you're putting them first. No sales manager will tell you that, but that's what builds your reputation. That's what gets you out on social. That's what allows people to start coming to you. So you're no longer the machine that has to work day in and day out to make things happen. And that's that moment where that added value comes in that you're not there in that conversation to simply sell and, and close, but to think, does that make sense to the buyer? Does it make sense right now? Does it make sense in, in the scope that we outlined? And if it doesn't make sense, I think one of the most trustworthy things to a, a salesperson can do is that I don't think we're a good fit, at least not for now. So may, maybe leave it for now to have that honesty to add value to the potential buyer and just be blatantly honest with them. Could you imagine if you walked into your doctors and they had, you go for your annual physical and they're like, you know what? I think that uh, you're due for some open heart surgery. We could go and make you buy on. I think we could probably fit you in two or three weeks from now. But because sales doesn't have a code of conduct, a governing body, it's never been rec recognized as a profession, which blows my mind. Somebody would, there'd be a sales manager pushing for somebody to do that because somebody's going to get paid. But what does a doctor do instead? They make observations and they point out what are the symptoms are. So if they come up, they'll call them. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's been driving me nuts listening to a couple of the people that have been reaching out to me and they're listening. Like a lot of metrics right now are designed to punish. I think I posted about it the other day. You look at all these managers and they're so reactionary and they're firing instead of coaching because I don't think they know how. Because yeah. everything's based on vanity metrics. You know, if you're tracking a few numbers and you're looking at pipeline, you're looking at opportunity to close ratio, and maybe you're looking at retention, and those can vary depending on how you're set up. But if your pipeline's too low based on your close rate, maybe we need to work on your prospecting. Oh, your opportunity to close rate's really low. Maybe we need to work on how you're navigating the sale or look back at how you're prospecting because maybe there's a qualification problem. But these, you can see this in advance when you're close enough to the sale or close enough to the individual and you're, you're coaching the process. But I think this year, 2022, is going to be the year of the sales manager where just showing up is not good enough and hiring and firing is their only job. They're going to have to actually coach. Yeah, yeah. And that's hard. That's, it is hard for several reasons. Uh, one, if you are used to treating the symptom instead of the disease, then that is what you continue to do. And if you have been told to treat the symptoms rather than the disease, then of course, that's all you know. And we circle back to a change in mindset, a change of attitude and a change of an understanding to, to look outside the sales box and look into the marketing box and look into the buyer's box as well and bring all of that knowledge and information together and then sit down as a sales manager and say, okay, what can we really do? And, and not just just tweaking a little bit here and there, but what would really make a difference that would really catapult us to the next level? You're, you're absolutely right. That's what needs to be done in, in 2022. This is one of the challenges, I think, and one of the great opportunities at the same time, especially for B2B companies, traditional companies, 
who have a chance to really stand out from an, an overcrowded market. So I really appreciate you mentioning that and, and pointing that out, that it is there's more to sales than, than what we know, than, than what sales managers know already. So I think an open mind is very helpful to steer into the right direction and correct the course a little bit. Yeah, even if we're looking at cost, make better margins. Demand gen, instead of doing a you know, spray and pray, like cold call or like sales development motion, demand gen is probably cheaper. Yeah. And then yeah. do really strategic outbound. I don't think outbound's dead. I just think that somehow it became marketing, marketing and sales switch lines and, yeah. you know, SDRs are doing field marketing work and getting underpaid and not giving the resources to do it right. <laughs> outbound is definitely part of the equation, but I would say done differently than what it used to be and, and how, how we saw or have seen it actually still what, what it can do. And you mentioned the, the cost involved in terms of what does an SDR do? What does a BDR do in terms of sitting down and doing you know, the same things over and over again, cold calling? When you really look at the numbers w without your ego involved, Right. So take your ego, set it aside and really look at the numbers and then think about, is that really the most effective way of how we can use the power that's within our sales team? Is it really that you mentioned a hundred calls a day? I've, I've been through that and, and I've, I've been in sales organizations where, where sales reps were celebrated of, for, for breaking the record and, and making 200 calls and then 230 calls a day. And I was just, I, I sat back and, and thought to myself, something's really wrong here. <laughs> that, that, that's not said they can't be serious, but they were. So I think that kind of holistic view that you provide on, on your LinkedIn with your content and also your own podcast to just drip feed that, that knowledge, that kind of medicine that opens up the, the sales managers minds and, and leadership's minds a little bit to how can we do it differently? I think it's, it's hugely important and the work that you do is hugely important for the four sales. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I, and if you looked at my profile, you may have seen it. I can't remember if I took it down, but my parents actually never thought I could make a living at sales and they still don't look at it like a profession. And Fine. one of my goals, one of my drivers is to see sales recognized like accounting and law because it's multidisciplinary and for children to go and tell their parents they want to be in sales and for them to be proud. Yeah. You know, but there's going to have to be some fundamental changes that happen for that to be real. Yeah. It, it still has that, the kind of notion of, oh, that's, that's sleazy or it's, you don't want to mess with that. You, it gets ugly and, and it's dirty and something like that. But, and that's a point where we thought about uh, the ethical point or the ethical angle in sales. How can you transform sales? into something that is ethical with, with doing the outbound, doing the prospecting, doing or leading the sales conversations in a way that is ethical, that is in line with, with your values without being, you know, sleazy or, or salesy or without ABC, always be closing. And I think I, th I really appreciate you being on, at the forefront of that because I think too, that this is what's necessary and, and this is what the market shows us that this is what all the data implies that this is what's going on on the other side, on, on the buy side, especially in B2B. And how can we help and, and guide sales to, to just acknowledge that and then just tweak it in such a way that it maps what, how their buyers would like to buy. I really appreciate that you bring up ethics. It's funny. I've been looking at a lot of cold like email sequences lately and uh, talking about ethics. Why is it that so many salespeople, the first thing they put in after hello, insert first name is I or we? Yeah. You want to talk about ethical? How can it be ethical if it's about you? Just if anybody can take one thing out, go look at your, think, look at your cold calls, look at your emails. Please, for goodness gracious, look at how you're using LinkedIn. 
And if the first thing you talk about is you, there's a problem. Something's wrong. I had a look at what was going on in, in the area of sales enablement and also buyer enablement. And I've both are absolutely crucial, but the one thing missing f for me personally in, in sales enablement is the buyer. Where's the buyer in sales enablement? You know, I, I, we know that we can enable the buyer and give them everything that they need to, so as much so that, that they make a decision to get in touch with us or not, um, or just give them all the information that they need to make a sophisticated decision. And on the other side, we can, of course, enable sales with new technology, with new ways of uh, getting insights into buy intent signals or something like that. There's all sophisticated software out there, AI powered. All of that is still completely vendor centric and, and seller centric. There's nothing in there that benefits the buyer. I think there is a gap in, in the market. If you bring that together with, you said it, coaching, internal coaching, external coaching, whatever works, sales enablement, but also buyer enablement. And when you bring that all together with management, with sales, with marketing, I think then you have a winning formula that is not salesy, it's not pushy, but it is still, it still generates a lot of revenue and a lot and drives a lot of demand. Mm -hmm. So if you only focus on one side of the equation, like the, the seller side or the vendor side, I think you're missing out on a huge opportunity. And, and if I may continue my rant, um, it's funny to me to, to hear a lot of sales uh, leaders and, and sales managers um, speak about the sales cycle. All right. What does the buyer have to do with your sales cycle? Absolutely nothing. Is, is that interesting to the buyer? No. Does it help the buyer? No, not really. But it's, you know, we need to tick and check our boxes internally. So not really. You don't have to. You don't have to. Just map it to the buyer journey, to, to how the buyer buys, all the stakeholders that's involved, all the decision makers that's involved, all the process and, and the procedures that they, and the hoops that they have to jump through. And forget about the sales cycle. It's the least important thing for the buyer. The whole reason we have a sales cycle is to close deals. Yeah. The whole reason that we sell is to provide value, or at least it should. My, my allegiance isn't to your investors. My reputation yeah. isn't based on your brand, but it could be. How disrespectful is it for companies to go and put a name on your back and then tell you to bark when, or jump? And yeah expect you to listen when really your job, if you took more of a customer success mindset is to find value. You're a value hunter, yeah. a relationship builder, a promise fulfiller, but that's hard to track. That's why it doesn't exist. And the problem is for a lot of this to work, you'd have to burn down RevOps and actually smart based in Calgary, Alberta. They just did an HBR article that was really good that they, they broke down their whole RevOps by jobs to be done. No sales, no marketing, no customer success. I think the change is happening. It's just slow. And the problem is the companies that can afford to do it are too big. The change management would kill them. And the small companies, like you look at a lot of the ones that are in their series A, B, and C, and they're going through this 100% headcount growth and who dictates their growth? venture capital and the yeah. KPIs they set on them. So at the end of the day, the only way we're going to go and have buyer centric is if the KPIs aren't about the companies yeah, and how much money they're going to gain, which is ironic too, because if they started tracking profit instead of just closed deals, a lot of business isn't profitable. Yeah. It's just make work projects. But that, that's a topic for a whole nother day. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's a good one. I think that you're absolutely right. I think I hear part two knocking at, at our door sometime because that's really getting into the nitty gritty things. But you're absolutely right. And I completely agree with you that the change is there, but it's, it's kind of simmering away under the surface. But, but I feel that there is, it's like a magnet. I, I feel like, 
it's drawing attention and and the right people are flocking around that i almost wanted to say movement but it's not a movement i think it's 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 really a change uh, a cultural change in sales in marketing in actually in in, in business because eventually it, it you know it just drips down from from sea level down to sales and marketing mm-hmm. and and that is also another topic we can talk about how can you make the sea level understand that have just raised i don't know 25 million in in funds that there is something they could do differently in an ethical way which eventually will provide them with a healthier business long term but short term explain that to your investors first that's the tricky part it's a hard conversation to have and the, yeah. you know what you know what i love about customers you don't have to pay them back yeah <laughs> that you're I think it's like bootstrapping at scale. And the problem, the problem is if you stop before you deliver on value, then you missed a huge opportunity. But if a lot of leadership could focus on that whole education process and look at how we make decisions and support mm-hmm. that, and then actually be dedicated to making sure they see value, you know, the know and grow is real. There's a reason why when companies see real value in you, they tell everyone and why social selling and word of mouth are the two most popular ways of growing a business, even though most people, like Chris Walker says from Refine Labs, most people won't see it because their software is telling them something different. Because once again, it's all about what you can track. This year, 2022, in terms of social selling and prospecting, what would you suggest or advise to a B2B company or B2B sales organization who would look into these two topics this year? Where to start? Where are the pitfalls? What to expect? What not to expect? Consumers have been taught to not trust sales. It's an epidemic. Social selling is our weapon to win. And if you put your customer first, you look at their jobs to be done, you look at where that friction starting from, you help them make proper changes by not forcing them, but educating, you'll earn their trust. It might not take a month, might not take three months, it might take more, depending on your sales cycles in your industry. I've heard reports that uh, social sell, indirect social selling, where you're not reaching out to people directly, can take two to three times your pipeline. So if your sales cycle is typically 60 days, times that by two or three, and that's what it usually takes to have healthy, profitable inbound coming your way. Look at it from the customer's perspective. Go talk to CS. Where are they realizing value? Put it out there. You know, it's hard being an SDR and BDR when you've never stepped in those shoes and you've never seen the product work. So go talk to service, figure out how it's working. Work with marketing to understand what customer knowledge they have and put your own spin on it. Be that trusted resource first. And when you're reaching out, think about it if you had a limit. You're only, you know, there's, we're going to go back to the hunter status that everybody seems to be so enthralled with. What if you only had five bullets? LinkedIn caps you out at 100 a week, 20 a day, Monday through Friday. What if you could only shoot five, five a day? How would that change your approach to outreach? I would start to ask myself why, because I'd have time to do my research and I would handpick those accounts, not auto-generate a list. Look at the accounts that pose the biggest gain from working with you and the greatest cost is sitting there doing nothing, where it's a no-brainer that when you nurture them, proper nurture them, not just send them endless freaking emails and call it a nurture, but take them through this process that there's real value at the end of the tunnel and do the work before. The biggest thing that has been driving me nuts is salespeople expecting decision makers and champions to figure out the value for them. What is the real value that you're proposing? Where are they going to see it? This is why it's so hard to get testimonials. Because if they knew, they would have already done it. That's why there's other stuff that's on the docket that's more important. 
So we need to slow down in order to speed up. We need to go and really quantify that value, build that value hypothesis, and be ruthless on testing it and be willing to walk away when it doesn't make sense so that you can build your reputation and earn business in the future. And that, and I'm sorry in advance, cause it's going to be really hard with quota or at least on activity metrics, but your pipeline will be healthy and a healthy pipeline solves all things. That's absolutely brilliant, Nick. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, you're welcome. I mean, I really wanted to have that conversation with you. I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't have accepted a no from you back then, <laughs> but it's absolutely fun. You're brilliant. We're going to, of course, link your LinkedIn and your podcast in the description below. And thank you again for taking the time and I'll see you on LinkedIn. I will see you on LinkedIn. Take care.